So our last class is about the world's opposition to the plan of salvation, God's plan. When we speak of the plan of salvation, we're including the Old Testament because God separated a people to take his message. So let's look to show our brothers to conclude what we are seeing today, what we are experiencing, and the events over the centuries. Let's start with the Old Testament. In the Old Testament, we will find the reason fighting against the revelation. The pastor already taught about original sin and showed that man, had, had, with reason, he, he connected with the enemy. So the world, when we use the word world to describe the operation of m the carnal man with the adversary, and the enemy fought from the first day to create a rebellion against God, saying that man is the master of himself, and he knows things. And it's possible for man to create for himself an environment where he is satisfied putting in his mind what does not exist. To not die is the perpetuity of existence. And at the same time, saying that man would be just like God. So from there, man started to struggle. And we're going to look at the Old Testament, the oppositions to God's project. What was God's project in the Old Testament? It was prophetic. God called a people prophetically. He chose a, 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 a land where this people should live, the land of Canaan. And he did everything that we know well in the Old Testament. It turns out that at a certain time, man didn't want to hear the voice of the Lord, as it was with Saul and other kings like Ahab. They thought that God could be subordinate to them and that they could take a stand and everything was done. I'm the king. I can determine what I want to do. This is what man always wants. He wants God to help him out. He does what he wants and God does everything that he determines. And what actually happens The Judaism left the project. Why? They didn't listen to the prophets because that's how God manifests himself amongst the people. The Israelites, the, they were a people that were chosen and separated. They were different from the nations around. And God, and they spoke of the one God. God wanted to reveal himself through the government, through the wars that you can see in all the Old Testament, the battles that they fought. God always wanted to give a blessing to the people and show that he was in front. And there was a time in Israel that no one else listened to the prophets. This was called the time interbiblical. It was about a 400-year period before Jesus. It was much more, but it was an interbiblical moment, the silence of the prophets. When they ceased to hear the voice of the Lord, what happened? They entered into apostasy because they resembled the peoples that were all around who had other gods. They were not the God of Israel. They didn't have the prophecy of Israel. So what was the culmination? It's when they killed the Messiah. Imagine they set aside the whole 
project of revelation and they did what they wanted to so all the behavior of those that were religious were all in that manner and what happened when the prophets stopped speaking they stopped because no one else wanted to hear them we can see this from uh, Elisha Elisha where they put Jeremiah in the dungeon and he complained about the situation of the people a people didn't want to hear me I'm gonna die here because of this people this was their justification the prophets were no longer listened to there was no place for them so look at the coincidence which is not a coincidence for the 400 years before Christ in these 400 years it was a moment of the silence of the prophets what entered who entered there the Greek philosophers and the philosophers from about 400 there were some great philosophers they were considered the Greeks they were so sophists they had a different idea from the other philosophers who came before them there were some other ones before but they they didn't have much material that they could not manifest themselves in the schools in the academic institutions and there are many of them who who remained with some philosophies like using mathematics like imagining the idea philosophy of cosmos which was a great project the cosmological so all the philosophy all the understanding was that God's creation so let's mathematics Pythagoras he came and he said that God had made the world with calculations the God of geometry he was building in his mind of Pythagoras and there was another period he said that everything was cosmology he wasn't worried about man but Protagoras was another philosopher who preceded the sophists these were the great three great philosophers the first the first one was Pythagoras he said that man man measures all things in this case we're going to look at the anthropological understanding the first was cosmologic it was the world and everything there was anthropological it was the concern of the philosophers to put man as the center of all things man was the manager of everything man was a piece of God he didn't need God so look so Socrates his idea was to know thyself he came much earlier with this way of thinking of the world and reason anticipating who was in the world and determining things was the power that man could be good on his own he could judge himself so Socrates said know yourself he was anticipating the Holy Spirit that would be poured out and even David when he said a thousand years before he said search me O God and see if there's anything wrong showing that man is unable to judge himself and if he is freed of his errors only through philosophy so this was the struggle we want to improve man so time went by and the understanding of philosophy began to turn towards 
towards theology. And I'd like to sh take your attention to these two aspects, philosophy and theology. When philosophy entered and blended with theology, everything went into one group. Theology became rational. It left that which was of the Holy Spirit and started to be which was of reason, which was philosophy. So let's go into the history of the church. The first century of the church, it was known as a moment that was Hellenistic. It was a great action of Hellenism, which was to bring the first century, all the Greek culture did, the culture that were the poets and everything of the culture was brought to the Roman Empire because the Roman Empire dominated the world in those days. So they had interest in distracting the people with arguments, with philosophical ideas in amphitheaters and arenas. There were places where they could discuss, as we see Paul in the Bible, in the Areopagus. He received people there, they discussed things, whether it was true or not. And even Pilate, when he called Jesus, he went to ask Jesus a question. He asked about the truth, because truth was something that was going around at that time. And philosophy tried to define what the truth was. It had this meaning, had this other meaning. And they understood that Jesus was a philosopher. Jesus, he said, did not answer him, because he had no reason of talking about philosophy. And in this period, there came other philosophies. From these three, the great philosophers, they came other philosophies. The Epicureanism, Stoicism, Gnosticism, and all of them were already there in the first century. In the first part, now we're in the first part, in the Christianity where Paul, he wrote to the Colossians about the danger of the vain philosophy. So we see here the struggles began in the Old Testament with philosophy, the reason trying to replace God's project. In the Old Testament it was against the prophecy, what was prophetic. So man had all the ability to live his life without the prophets. And they were talking about the prophecy. They didn't understand, they didn't interest, they weren't interested. We know what we want religion decided on everything and I was talking about theology and the philosophers because now that teachers and our pastors will hear a lot about this the children that are going into school eight and nine years old they're learning about philosophy and they say that the philosophers believe in God and they even say that Plato and Aristotle believe in God that doesn't exist they understood that there was a God. Theology, which emerged at that time, it was understood, was linked to two aspects. They were the poetic, their origin, origin was poetic, and was mystical. Therefore, instead of using the word God, they used the word gods, they used plural because the mystics of the Greeks, they spoke of a god for everything. The gods, all these gods formed a great god, and they had nothing to do with the Savior, our God, the God of Israel, the God, the Father, the God, the Son, the God, the Holy Spirit. It was much earlier than Jesus. So this was the philosophical idea. There's n so a child comes today and they say Plato believed in God. No, Plato, he had an understanding of an existence of God, but he didn't know how to explain it. This is the understanding I, I brought in this morning about Logos. It was a human understanding, natural theology. It was natural theology. It was something that says, is a theology that was natural. 
it does not depend on the Holy Spirit. If I say God exists, I'm speaking of a natural theology. God exists because he is in the, in the flower or in the bee. He's in the ant. This is called pantheism. This does not say, speak about the plan of salvation. Philosophy, when it enters into history, it enters taking the place that was of the Lord. God wanted to transmit, but man has his free will. Therefore, it enters to change the meaning of things. There it's the human side. All that is used in philosophy, everything that's in reason, there is philosophy. This was the theology that they understood before Jesus. Then came the theology of the early church days, the first hundred years. The so, so what happened? There was a group in the church that were called theologians. They had discussions. The church had a doctrine. You're already aware of the four doctrinal foundation of the Reformation that were in the doctrine of the early church. There were arguments. If God was Father, if Jesus was a creation, creator, if he came before or after, there were arguments. So if you can have an idea, you'll find books that fought of the origins of certain ideas, writers, if you want to read them, arguing about ideas, each idea worse than the other, about the Trinity, even what some people say today because they don't understand anything about the Trinity. So look, this group that succeeded Paul in God, they started to be strengthened in the church. They were called the Patristes. They were the fathers of the church. And with them, when they understood that, they didn't need the Bible anymore. Those men, they gave the direction to the church. The, the Patristes, they understood that the world needed to be governed by the church. That's what the church wanted. And for this to happen, they needed to have a leader. That was the, the holiness there. And, and some wrote naively to please that religious structure. When it came to 312, when Constantine stopped the persecution and accepted the pagans to be Christians, the pagans simply entered the church without having an experience of salvation and no new birth. They became Christians. This was Christianity that introduced the whole history of the Middle Ages, about 1,000 years. And after, and after Constantine, the understanding began that reason could justify faith. And when they took the four beginning beliefs of the early church, of the primitive church, of early church, the church began to drift. And then there was a group that explained what faith was. In 425, around the time of the medieval period, then entered Augustine, the Bishop of Hippo in Africa. He spoke, he said, I'm converted. He said that Jesus, grace, salvation, and what many in the evangelical environment, in, in he confused a few things. And man needs to do something. Now, by grace, he doesn't need to do anything. He didn't have much notion. And so time goes by, 
and from 1225, then we see Thomas Aquinas, Aquinas. He was a great philosopher whom the church rejected at the beginning. Then would, he would be accepted later on after the Council of Trent in 1570. And there the church said, no, the philosophy that is no longer Augustine, but it's now Thomas Aquinas. Why? Because Thomas had arranged various things that established the government that the church had. The world of that time came to be ruled by the church. Constantine left to the east. He had a church there on the other side because of the persecutions in Rome. And he gives the government of the world to the Christian church of that time. And this church had its 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 fiefdoms with whom it, it managed. It was the feudal period. The feuds, the feudal, the fiefs were attached to her. If there was any rebellion, the church combined and, and stopped the rebellion there. The church, in this moment, began to understand that the world was falling into a void. The wealthiest merchants and the scholars, they were helpless. The church began to get worried. They created the universities, like that of a Bologna, a Salamanca in Spain, Oxford, Cambridge, and Paris. They filled the world of that time. When the church created the universities, it was in a continent. Here's the continent. At the side of the continent was England. That was not under the dominion of the church, of this Christianity. They were isolated and didn't want to talk with what was happening in the fiefdoms. So this brought here some great teachings and theology. They competed with the other ones. What's important for us in philosophy is that philosophy is reason. All reason is philosophy. Everything that you had in your mind is reason. It's no problem. So what do you think about this? Philosophy manifests itself through an expression that you will see. No one needs to remember this word, but in, you, have to keep, you can't forget this word, metaphysics. Metaphysics is the way which philosophy expresses itself. This is important. So what is metaphysics? There are many explanations, many teachers here. It's beyond physics. So look, what's important for us to understand? It's meta physics with two things. Material, matter, and mind, or reason. So look here. The matter is pro-extensive. I'll explain this. And this here, the mind, is pro, pro cogito. Is to, to think. Thinking, or in formulating, or inventing. This is it. So philosophy, the basis of philosophy is metaphysics. So let's look at an example. Your mind is here. It's here. 
It's here. It's thinking about the world where you live. You live in the world. It's available to you. You can think, go to, go to England, Japan. You can think about what you'd like. What these, what these three brothers here are thinking, they're brothers. But n neither of them think the same way about their position before the world. He thinks one way, the other one thinks the other way. They may even agree, but the thought is pro-extensive. This pro-extensive means when he's going, he's going this way, the other one's going the other. We have in the world how many philosophers? Today we have 7 billion and 400 million people. So we have 7 billion, 400 million people, each one thinking they want to think. The sister, she thinks the way she wants to think. Because your mind is yours, is another one. You can agree because of love, because of interests. I don't know, you don't even know what we're thinking about. Because of a physical attraction. All of this, and what you think it's beautiful, it's ugly, this is the benefit. So let's look here. So this, everything that you do in philosophy, you use, use, use your mind to function. It's called pro cogito. It's what you think. You're gonna. It's gonna look at thinking about matter. You can make any philosophy. This is a general philosophy. There are specific philosophies of the geniuses. You can't say that Aristotle or Socrates weren't geniuses. They had topics that they thought about that no one else could understand. Pro cogito. So look here. So philosophy is therefore when you look at your mind and matter, the, the mind and the extension to matter, you are in what what dimension? What m dimension? The fourth dimension. So everyone's in the fourth dimension. There's no problem. This is the philosophy. And it is in such a way that you can never forget all of those. You can see all the philosophers. Hegel, his philosophy was about the mind. The word in, in German, German was was his mind. You're going to find Hilmi. He was another philosopher. Kant, he was another philosopher. All of those spoke. They understood that the basis of philosophy was in the mind, in reason. So reason is different than revelation, yes or no? Yes. Why? So reason is inside a, a project of creation. When I think, I'm in the design of creation. So the philosopher in the beginning, in 1595, Descartes, all who knows him, he says, I think, therefore I am. Cogito, in Latin. Cogito ergo sum. I think, therefore I am. So you want to take this phrase, I think, therefore I am. That was from him. So look, he came in the beginning 
and after the religious reformation. So what I'm saying is what I said in the beginning, that metaphysics is within, he was within metaphysics, metaphysics. Kant was in metaphysics, the great philosophers and the small philosophers, they were all within metaphysics. Why? Because they didn't leave this. Metaphysics can't go beyond what reason can reach. It can't go beyond. It doesn't leave this. Metaphysics is energy. Metaphysics is a form of expressing by energy. Energy is of man. Your mind is thinking, is spending, and it, it, it has a weight. When you're thinking, when you're thinking, you're losing energy. How many people knew that? This energy that leaves your head, it doesn't go outside the universe. It stays inside the universe. It's the law of conservation of energy, of Lavoisier, preserving energy energy. Everything that's done here stays here. It changes. So if you can have an idea, when your brain is working, you have a number of elements. There are synapses that happen through the neurons. They are working in one cell. One cell has the capacity of a computer. One cell that you don't see has the capacity of a computer. One cell in you has the capacity of a computer. So look, it's extraordinary. So man, he wants to use this. This stays here. It'll stay here. It'll die here. So there'll be a time. So brothers, you have to understand that the great struggle that the church fought was with reason. Augustine entered, then Aquinas, and when Luther came, Thomas Aquinas, he used reason for three things. He had to take away all of his philosophy from the Patriots, philosophy, and the Bible. There's no way to, to mix these three things. You can't mix the Bible. Because this is the revealed word. This isn't. But philosophy is the, what's known. Philosophy it comes from what's known. Revelation isn't that way. Revelation comes from what's not known. Faith, it's the project that comes from eternity. You can't mix these together. You can't mix revelation. It doesn't mix with this. It's not able to. You want to see something. This is reason. Philosophy is reason. I'm showing here reason. I'm speaking of matter. Everything that is matter expresses itself to the death. It'll have an end. And this matter will not leave here. That's what Lavoisier said. Nothing is nothing created or destroyed, it just transforms. It's the law of conservation of energy. This matter does not transcend. And when Thomas Aquinas says that you eat this bread, this host, and it will trans transubstantiation, you take it, it was put before the, the pastor or the priest and it it is transformed into body and blood of Jesus transubstantiation you can't bite it those things 
This was great for the church because the church needed a material element to justify the faith that she had lost. So let's go back here. So matter matters here inside. It doesn't leave here. The operation of God is here. It's another universe. And it commands all the other universes. The worlds were created. We're used to hear this. So let's go here and look. When Augustine used these three arguments, he used reason. He entered into the reason to make philosophy. And he used a Christianity and a philosophy. He used matter. And matter cannot equal with what's of the Spirit. What's, which is matter died when Jesus died on the cross of Calvary. His blood stayed on the ground. What remained was the fellowship with the Holy Spirit. That remained. That's not matter. What connects man to eternity is not matter. It needs to come from eternity. Jesus came from eternity. He returned back. When he returned, he left his Holy Spirit. He returned. You can use whatever words you want. He poured out the Holy Spirit. When he shed the Holy Spirit, he didn't need to have any more strength with reason. Where do we want to go? The matter stays here on earth, and no one can, can get rid of this. There's no way to take the material away. When you lose reason, when you lose your, your reason, when you're using your reason, you're using your energy. You lose energy. You lose, you lose material, weight. Light is matter. Sound is matter. Your thoughts are matter. So where there we see the thought, the people, thought leaders, the great people that were thinking. Why does it matter? Because no theologian used the Holy Spirit. He wants to use homiletics, hermeneutics, apologetics, systematics, dogmatics. That's reason. That's why a course of theology, for those that knows this work, has little value. With Bible knowledge, you can get it anywhere. You can read the Bible every day. Because when we put this here, when the theologian put this here to study, he used the reason. When he uses reason, he removes the blessing of the Spirit and faith. We have to define what faith is. If he doesn't have faith, he takes philosophy to define faith. He gets it by his head. He takes the individual that never believed in anything, and he defines faith. My brothers, where do we want to get to? We want to say, is philosophy sin? No, anyone can be a philosopher. You can be a philosopher. Is theology sin? I don't, I don't know. Studying the Bible is one thing. Doing Bible theology is something else. I want to look at something. When the 60s, I want to conclude, because this is a vast topic. I don't want to take too long. When we got to the 60s, what did we face? With who? Luther? Luther? was confronting with theology and philosophy. He, he says, take away your philosophy. That's what he said. Philosophy is prostitute of the church. That's what he said. Why did he say that? Because he was a teacher of philosophy and teacher in philosophy and theology. When he understood this, what happened, everyone was afraid. After the Reformation, there was the post-reformers, and here was the world that was there, and there was England, here was Europe, here was England. The theology went inside the universities, of the Protestant universities of Cambridge, of Oxford, 
And so what happened? There was a theology and philosophy of deist. What is deism? What was deism? Was knowing God by reason. It was natural theology. So look here. In 1725, during this period, when there was a revival, pouring out of the Holy Spirit, John Wesley, he was a deist. He was converted. The Holy Spirit fell upon him. The deists of England in Oxford and Cambridge, they came up. There was one that wrote a treaty against Wesley saying, was Butler, he wrote, was going against him because he had received the blessing of the Holy Spirit. And the Holy Spirit, reason, they didn't need the Holy Spirit because reason did everything. Theology is reason. And I ask you, is reason ma material a science? What is it? It's science and matter. You can, you can say God spoke. The philosopher said this, the theologian said this, and it came to a moment where we came here, the period of the 60s, what did we come up with? There were the Protestant theologians that were part of the deist school. You're going to find Buchmann, Bruner, Albert Schweitzer, do you know what they preached? Theologians, they preached that there would not be salvation. They were liberalism. They went against God's word. Theologians, they taught all, all these students. They had to agree with them. Schweitzer, he was a man. He was a remarkable man. He went from Africa. He was a physician. He went to work in Africa with the tribes. He was working with them. And he went to the United States. He taught. He, he, he gave shows of piano to raise money. But what he said about Jesus and the gospel, there's no way to measure. They were called theologians that were libertine. The great defeat of the world was when theology united with philosophy. When theology and philosophy came together. Theology plus philosophy it's an ideology. There's nothing there's no one that can go up against this this ideology. What was the great ideology and philosophy created? What was the great ideology? It was communism. So theology was of Engel and the philosophy came from Marx. They also, he was a, philo a theologian. He was taught by Bruno Bauer. Bruno Bauer was a theologian. He was not a believer. He preached blasphemy. If those that know the history, he was an advanced theologian. 
He said, I can only preach in the university if I can blaspheme. He, he blasphemed so much. He, he said, I'm going to continue with a Bible study of blasphemy in my church. Kant, he was another philosopher. He didn't have anything to do with Christianity. He shows... He started to show that God doesn't exist. And he spoke bad. After him came theologians like Kant. And these ones that spoke their names, all of them were called theologians. They were liberal theologians. So concluding, a great theologian came to die in the 80s. Karl Barth, he wrote a treatise on God and theology. What did he say? He said, the Bible was not the Word of God, but it contained the Word of God. He did this because he used a dogma. He was dogmatic. It's reason. It's not revelation. There is no theology without dogmatics. And I challenge any place in Brazil Hear what I'm saying. Let's say what I'm saying. And I ask you, the church will live with this. A few days ago, a lady came to the Manaim. She had lost her two children. Do you know why? Philosophy. Why? What happens in the movements? They can't resist the doctrine has no structure, no security. The work is not like that. Philosophy here is in the fourth dimension. It's philosophy. The pastor needs to say that. The pastor may not know under, understand philosophy, but he has to know that philosophy is in the fourth dimension. You can, you can take a course on philosophy. You can, there's courses. There's classes. You can even have a master's to say that God doesn't exist. There's no faithful believer who wants to study philosophy. If he doesn't leave there, he leaves the gospel. It doesn't happen. When he comes, he receives a blessing, but instead of preaching which is of the Spirit, he preaches what's in reason. It's easier. So-and-so said this. So-and-so said, I don't want to know what they're saying. I want to know what the Holy Spirit is revealing. So let's conclude. There's a lot to say. Where are we today? Where are we? The, today we see philosophy of relativity, the other philosophy. The gospel has lost its way because it's a l stopped listening to the revelation and start to listen to philosophy. The ideological war with, with communism and socialism against democracy and all the thing. Do you know what the theologian did? Do you know what, where he went? He went to the material side. He didn't go to the spiritual. Do you know why? Because he lost the faith. So what did he say? God died. He wrote a defense, was, was published in the 70s that we preach when we left, left, we said this is the man, the gospel is defending the gospel, it said God died. I want to ask you a question. The day we came here and say that God is dead, how many will stay here? How many is going to stay? None. They have a seminar try to try to explain faith by reason. Faith by reason is all reason without faith. There's no such thing. Faith is a gift of God. Theology doesn't enter in because it is rational. It uses hermeneutics, homiletics, apologetics, exegoge. It uses all of this, their ways, rationally, 
to decipher the Bible, something that only the Holy Spirit can do. When the Holy Spirit doesn't do it, then man in invents these things. Brothers, there's a lot to be said, but I want to leave today the Sunday school teachers and to the pastors. If you have a problem, sometimes there's going to be a child having a, a law course. He's starting philosophy and he starts going to hinder and hurt the pastor. It came to be used in spiritual gifts because this young man says he doesn't need the spiritual gifts. He's going to follow philosophy. You can't explain it. But if you need a position, the pastor can position himself. Today, you have seminars, you have the institute, you can tell these people, tell them to write to one of us. We'll, we'll pay for his ticket. There was a person, I, I asked three questions, they didn't answer one. So start your your gospel again. Your gospel is a sick gospel. And now is the moment to not let the church go up. Now I ask you, what's the big problem to di divert man from the project of God? It's philosophy mixed with theology. That is why inside the house, that's why apostasy came. Apostasy is if you leave faith and you enter into reason. Enter into reason. You're going to explain the Bible by reason. Okay, let's stand.